good morning. First of all, on behalf of the Center for Governance Studies, okay. I would like to okay. welcome you all to this serious public lecture. In this occasion, we would like to have an extraordinary extempore lecture from Dr. Samir Saran on India, Bangladesh, and Indo-Pacific. After his speech, there will be a question and answer session. Let's start with today's chair, Prof. Dr. Matar Rahman, President Bangladesh Political Science Association and Chairman of the Center for Governance Studies. Mr. Chair, please what you. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to extend one welcome to Dr. Samir Saran, President of the Observer Research Foundation for his maiden visit to Bangladesh and also for his kind cooperation with us to speak on this occasion. The topic of this today's lecture is India, Bangladesh and Indo-Pacific. I think uh, the distinguished uh, audience we have today will have a lot of interaction. Just by way of introduction, I would like to say some words about it. Uh, first of all, the concept of Indo-Pacific and its strategy or strategic setting has added a new significance for geopolitics and geoeconomics in Asia. And uh, you know very well that the center for gravity of the world had changed a lot from US, America, uh, US, Europe, and now we talk about Asia. Referent for the Trump administration's foreign policy towards Asia, East, Southeast Asia, and South and the Pacific. In the Pacific, first of all, is a, I just want to make it clear, has always been there as a geographic concept but it's signaled now much more than that. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, before the lecture begins, allow me to introduce the speaker. He's uh, Dr. Samir Saran, who is the president of Observer Research Foundation, Why? one of Asia's most influential <laughs> think tanks. He, he curates the Rising Adal, India's annual flagship platform on geopolitics and economics, and chair sci fi. India's annual conference on cyber security and internet governance. Sobir is also a commissioner of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyber States, member of the <coughs> South Asia Advisory Board of the World Economic Forum, and a part of its Global Future Council on Cyber Security. He is also the director of the Center for Peace and Security at the South Asia Global Fashion Police University, Jodhpur, India. So we guide specifically on issues of global governance, climate change, energy policy. Diplomats. Uh, as some of you did mention to me when I was meeting you prior to this lecture, uh, that is this your first visit to Bangladesh? And yes, unfortunately, this is my first visit to Bangladesh, and I, the loss has been mine. I think uh, it's rather embarrassing, and it's a state of affairs in the region that. Uh, it took me so long to get here, but I promise to be here more regularly and you're going to be sick of me in a couple of years. I'm going to be here so often. I think this is a dynamic geography. Uh, I was mentioning to my colleagues, this feels like home, this is home, and we have to certainly engage uh, more robustly with uh, civil society, academia, media, uh, and also, of course, uh, the policy community that is shaping the region. Observer Research Foundation, as we speak, is uh, currently hosting 20 young leaders from Bangladesh, including many parliamentarians who are on a visit to India. And our relationship, uh, despite my not being uh, a regular visitor here, is very robust. I think we have, uh, over the past decade, developed very strong linkages. We have scholars who come here often. One of our senior fellows was the ambassador to uh, Bangladesh, uh, Ambassador Pimat Chakravarti, uh, Jovita Bhattacharya, my colleague who works in South Asia, is a regular part of your community. I think she visits India sometimes. She's mostly uh, in Bangladesh. And we have a number of young scholars who see this as a vital part of their research and study agenda. 
we are also determined and committed to uh, strengthen this relationship further. Uh, there are some projects under wraps which will be announced soon. <coughs> And uh, one of the purposes of this visit was to finalize those ambitious projects that will help us build a permanent relationship with some institutions here and hopefully create research and convenings that will help us understand and respond to the theme of today, the Indo-Pacific Bangladesh and India. What I'm going to do is, I'm not going to like uh, uh, give a public lecture as Zeroor has introduced this, but maybe we share some thoughts and ideas with you and hopefully receive some pushback at the end of it. I want to start by placing this lecture in the context of where we are today as a world. And I want to share three collisions with you that are underway. Three tectonic shifts are taking place as we sit here in this room. The first, of course, is as uh, the chairperson mentioned, the complicated and complex joining of the in Indian Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. Now it's easy to coin a term, it's easy to call something by a name, but the name has implications. <coughs> the institutions that manage the Pacific and the institutions that manage the Indian Ocean were distinct. The political dynamics of, the, of both the regions were separate. The market ethics in both parts were also very separate. And when we join these two together and create one big geostrategic sphere, it's a complex process. So I think even as we sit today, the collision of the Indian Ocean with the Pacific is still underway. The institutions that will respond to this collision are still in their infancy. The ethics and principles that will govern this new geostrategic construct are still being discovered. And the powers who will underwrite stability, security and growth in this new region are still jostling for space. Will it be the United States which coined the term Indo-Pacific who will dominate the Indo-Pacific? Or will you see an incumbent who will rise to the challenge and dominate this new area? Early signs indicate that the only country that has successfully through their own institutions and policies and politics connected the Indian Ocean to the Pacific is China. So while the Americans may have written papers about the Indo-Pacific, the Chinese have put institutions and infrastructure on the ground as it were. They have built ports, they have created shipping links, they have created trade ties, they have created an economic arrangement, they have institutions like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank which is committing money across this region. They are building relationships for the Indo-Pacific. So if today you were to Ask me, I would respond that the only country that is truly an Indo-Pacific power and an Indo-Pacific player, it is China. The rest are just talking. So that's the first collision and the first respondent to the first collision. The second collision that is taking place is the re-emergence of the supercontinent called Eurasia. The colonial divisions of Europe and Asia were artificial. It was a single landmass which had historic trade ties, historic movements of people, goods, customs, cultures, cuisines, costumes. And that region is now being reintegrated. Asia and Europe are becoming one again. Through huge connectivity projects, through the sheer weight of Asia's economic muscle today, the movement of goods and services is moving towards Europe. And the sheer new political power that resides in four or five new strong Asian countries ensures that the influence matters far beyond the original continent. So politics, commerce and infrastructure are reconnecting Asia and Europe. Asia and Europe is now Eurasia and it is not the Russian Eurasia. It is the Eurasia, the supercontinent which connects Western Europe to Tokyo. It is that Eurasia we are talking. And this is the second collision which is underway. And again, the only country that is truly a Eurasian player, a Eurasian actor, which has built infrastructure to connect Shenzhen to Vienna, Austria, are the Chinese. The Chinese today are the only Eurasian actor. And they are the only major power 
that have understood the opportunities and the perils of the second collision which is underway, the rejoining of Asia with Europe. The third collision underway is the collapse of the virtual world with the real world. There is no cyberspace. Anyone who tells me that I'm, uh, we need a separate body for cyberspace is wasting his time. Cyber is the real space. Our imagined and our real world have collided. Our perceptions and our realities are the same. Our future is shaped by a mediated ecosystem. Our decisions are influenced by bits and bytes. The collapse of the real with the virtual is the third collision which is underway. Which means that the power of discourse, the power of narratives, the power of communications has become democratized. There are more voices who are able to shape conversations and politics than ever before. Which means that the old elites, many of which who are in this room, are today joined by the new voices who are able to use the power of technology, disrupt, challenge and change political outcomes. Think tanks like mine are today perhaps less important than they were 20 years ago. They are also less effective than the mobilization social media can create. Some of the most important changes that have happened in the last 10 years have occurred due to the power of technology. A single man, a single woman, a single young youth was able to create millions of, uh, of uh, convenings uh, around the world, across the world to lobby, advocate, challenge and change issues of importance. And in many ways, all of these three are going to change our roles in the world. India's role in the world and Bangladesh's role in the world. Our easy existence in the subcontinent of South Asia is gone. There is no subcontinent of South Asia anymore. The same actor who connected Europe to Asia and the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean also does not recognize the existence of South Asia anymore. South Asia was an artificial construct which has been overwhelmed by forces of market integration, financial flows, infrastructure and politics. We are Eurasian actors. Bangladesh and India are both an important part of Eurasia, are core actors in the Indo-Pacific and will have to navigate both the opportunities and challenges that the collapse of the virtual with the real offer us. <coughs> There are two other important aspects that I wanted to mention before I specifically speak about India and Bangladesh. The first, we are also in a moment in time when we are undertaking a very new political experiment. We are trying to find ways to sustain multilateralism, the multilateral institutions, the UN framework, the trading frameworks, the financial frameworks, in a world which is truly multipolar. There is no single actor who is a hegemon in the 20th century definition anymore. In the 20th century, certainly in the last decade of the 20th century and in the first decade of this century, the Americans could punish bad behavior and reward good behavior. There is no actor in the world who can do that today, not even the Americans. Today we have many actors who can punish, but very few who can catalyze good responses. We have many powers with capabilities to destroy, but very few with the capacity to create using their own political will and political resources and financial muscles. And this has never been done before. The multilateral system that we depend on, the UN agencies, human bodies that we so believe in, were created in a world which was underwritten by two powers. The USSR and the US underwrote the multilateral architecture for much of the 20th century. And from the 90s and the noughties, the early 2000s, what we saw was a unipolar world where America 
and some of its partners underwrote the same multilateral system. Multilateralism has never worked with multipolarity. This is a new experiment. And I can say it's not going too well. We can see multilateral institutions are struggling. They have no single underwriter of their performance, guarantor of their efficacy, and supporter of their outcomes that these institutions were designed for. And in this world where multilateralism in many ways is not the same anymore, what are the options available for all of us who require a rules-based order, who require stability, who require predictability, who require <coughs> regulatory certainty? And many of us are still searching for those formats where some of these ideals may be realized. Some of them have come up with small, smaller groupings, plurilateral clubs, such as the BRICS or the SCO or the ASEAN or even uh, IPSA, BIMSTEC, BBI. Some are suggesting that perhaps we need to change the top-down model of managing the world and create a bottoms-up model of integration. Some are suggesting regional integration is the way forward. Perhaps smaller regions need to create their own architecture and in some fashion coordinate with other regions to create a stable order. But this is an experiment which is still underway. And we are not sure whether uh, where the wind will blow, but certainly in the next decade, I suspect, uh, the laboratory of creating a political order will be very busy. And again, if this is the Asian century, and if we seek a political order, India and Bangladesh will be important parts of this experimentation, of the new design that might emerge, of the new system that we might all agree with. As countries that account for close to or over 1.5 billion people, it is an imperative for both of us that our voices influence any new system. The second process which is underway is that even as markets have expanded, the stakes of countries around the world, you know, you go to London and you buy a garment produced in Bangladesh. So what happens in UK, what happens in Brexit, what happens in the European Union is important for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is no longer confined to its territorial confines. It has stakes which are far wider. Same is true for India. So even as our stakes have expanded to vast geographies around the world, our democracies and our political systems and our regimes, and, and I'm, this talk is not on democracy and its fundamentals, but whichever political system we have embraced, we find that we are becoming far more insular and inward-looking. Political systems around the world are less internationally oriented than they ever were. We are far more nationally preoccupied today, even as our economic influence is far widely dispersed than ever before. And this is a contradiction, that our governments are focused inwards, even as our interests lie outside. And there is a mismatch, therefore, both in terms of political attention and in terms of resources devoted to building a political system that responds to our geoeconomic requirements. And I think this is, in many ways, the first proposition that I want to place before you, that we have a new political world, a new uh, map of the world, but in various parts of the world. Coalitions and new collectives and a community-based approach is the only response to these modern threats to the nation state, to progressive societies, and to secular and liberal existence. And defending this secular liberal existence, defending the modern cosmopolitan perspective, defending a progressive community-based 
existence must be the priority for these two countries again. We must co-invest in strengthening a plural, liberal and a vibrant nation. And that must be the second most important agenda for India and Bangladesh. If we don't do this, we know Indo-Pacific will have a color red. We are pretty much the last two countries standing which are fighting and serving the cause of pluralism, democracy and a liberal system. And we should not demonize systems and outcomes and political parties and personalities. We have to go beyond that. We have to invest in institutions. If we build strong institutions, regional and national, we will insulate ourselves from personality-based decision-making processes and, and issues. So building institutions that's, that serve the region and its pluralism must be the second most important agenda item for India and Bangladesh. And sometimes when we work uh, across borders, we are able to resolve internal politics more easily. The European Union many a times was able to change politics of their individual member states because they agreed to a collective vision for the region. They were able to change national politics. Sometimes let's use international commitments for better domestic outcomes. The third and the most important uh, area where India and Bangladesh have to work to serve much of Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia and other developing parts of the world is to create lighthouses, That's something I mentioned yesterday as well in one of my conversations. The solutions to poverty eradication, the solutions to low-cost renewable energy, the solutions to achieve water efficiency, the solutions for inclusion and mainstreaming of those who have been left out do not exist in the OECD. If someone from Germany comes and tells you, I will help you fight poverty, tell him go back home, you never fought poverty, find poverty at home and find it there. The challenges exist here. The scale and the scope of the response that is required is unparalleled. No one in the world has to do as much we have to do. And guess what? We are now in the IKEA world, the IKEA world. It's a do-it-yourself world. No one is going to come and solve and they help us find answers to these important questions. And the good news is that our countries are doing it. We may not be happy with the pace, we may be dissatisfied with some of the politics, but the reality is that sheer numbers tell you that the region has moved a long way in the last 20 years. We can be critical of today, but if you look at a historic trend, we have moved a long distance, a fair distance. And we therefore must start seeing ourselves not as recipients of aid or grants or technologies or solutions, but as providers of new opportunities to others. India receives much of its solar energy infrastructure from the Chinese, money from commercial banks, investing capitals, know-how and innovation, uh, intellectual property from Europe and America. But yet, after putting all of this together, the cost of solar energy in India is cheaper in any of these countries. India is able to aggregate solar installations at a lowest cost. Bangladesh has transformed the way mobile and gender have led to a certain new format of growth. All of these are solutions that we can provide. We must become the garage of sustainable development goals where countries who seek to respond to their own realities can come to this garage, pick up the solution and go back home and use it the way they want. We have to start imagining ourselves as providers of development solutions. Since development and growth have now conflated, India and Bangladesh in the next 10 years will become important economic actors as well. We will be providing low-cost energy solutions, we will be providing ways to connect your rural countryside, we will be providing solutions for rural supply chains, we will be offering solutions for food security, etc., etc. Using technology, using uh, grassroots innovation, using community-led approaches, we are changing the way we develop. And it's time that we start seeing ourselves as development providers for many other countries who are going to the same. I want to conclude by saying that uh, bilaterally and certainly at the government level, 
our relationship has never been stronger. I think uh, the convergence between Dhaka and New Delhi is robust. I was told by uh, your foreign minister yesterday that a couple of days ago we have agreed on four more initiatives that we will be pursuing on a video conference call with leadership on both sides. India and Bangladesh are continuing to find new ways of doing things. You know, now we are looking at uh, robust collaboration in the digital sector, uh, the water sector. Uh, we already have a robust uh, energy sector cooperation. Uh, much of the border irritants have been removed. Hopefully, in the next Indian political uh, arrangement, we will find solution to Pista as well. But I still believe we are nowhere near the full potential of what we can be. And I think there are two vital ingredients which are missing. <clears throat> Our communities need to be far more integrated than they are today. Our academic communities, our artist communities, our business communities, our grassroots workers. A new community that includes individuals and actors from India and Africa, uh, India and Bangladesh, India and other developing countries, Bangladesh and Southeast Asia must emerge. We must become the hub that coalesces communities which seek similar outcomes work together. We must become that hub that creates these communities. And for that, we need to first ensure that our communities merge. So we need far more people-to-people -people engagement, a far stronger communities engagement. And I think that's a vital ingredient that's missing. I will ask the question that Rabindranath Tagore is an icon in both countries. And what do I feel about it? I said the only thing I feel about it is that it is disappointing that we have not produced many more Rabindranath Tagore's who are cultural icons on both sides of the border. Our cultural intimacy has to also be enhanced. We are one people, and of course we watch each other in soap operas and, and, and television and, and, and movies. But I think the cultural connect also needs to be enhanced. I always give people the example of India and the US. Uh, till the time the Soviet Union was alive, uh, they were a much stronger partner for India. I think within 24 hours of the end of the Soviet Union, India and US were best friends. It's because the people to people connect and the cultural affinity was robust. Our relationship was not based on government's orientation. Our relationship was bottoms up. We need a new bottoms up engagement a middle class engagement, an uh, artisan's engagement, an artist's engagement, a business engagement that starts taking over a relationship which is largely government to government. We have to move beyond the G2G and create a P2P format of partnering with each other on a common century, on a common region, and on, of course, a common future. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for it. Okay. Talks. Now the question and answer sessions. The T4 segments which will take uh, first of all uh, two three questions to you, then answer and then back to you. I think please uh Abu Hassan for three. Former State Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, there are only the forms which only a rose had. And let me come straight to the point. Our interest can and is firmly to have security in energy, our integrity, but to have absolute economic development. That is what we are focused in. That is what is our challenge. India, by its very history, by its very size, has other roles to play. Sometimes, uh, certain commercial decisions are unfortunately, you see in a discourse like this, if I don't talk openly, then neither you nor I gain anything. And I have now the unique advantage of neither being in government nor not being in government. So, 
in, in no party uh, is misunderstood. And the example that I have in mind is what I have gathered is at one point Bangladesh itself was very keen for a deep sea port which the Chinese were again very interested to build. We have a honorable former ambassador of Bangladesh to China here. And this we understand was uh, <coughs> scuttled due to certain squeamishness on the part of India. Now, you have mentioned rightly about the very strong and deep relationship with India. It should be even stronger. My uh, sadness is that it should have been viewed as merely a commercial proposition, where nothing other than a economic benefit would have accrued to the country and also to, to India. So I think I absolutely endorse your viewpoint that in order to not only underscore but to have a clearer understanding, the communities, the societies, the civil societies must get together to be able to resolve this. Other thing is that yes, Bangladesh has uh, marched forward, it has uh, outpaced many South Asian countries and as a humble initial uh, signatory on behalf of Bangladesh for the Bimstick, I can assure you the whole purpose was that our country would be considered a bridge between South Asia and Southeast Asia. But there again, we now have this problem with the Rohingyas threatening because our whole focus is on developing the country. And if, God forbid, something of that nature even looms as a dark cloud, from our absolute friends from the other side, it would unfortunately have a very, not so beneficial effect. And the third point I would like to raise, and this is my conclusion point, because although uh, Mr. Zilu Rahman is uh, one of our very favorite anchors, historic anchor, he is not Arnab Goswami, but even he may lose his patience. Uh, that is the BRI and the Infrastructure Development Bank of China. Now, about this, we know of the Indian perspective, we also know of the American perspective. But coming down here, today I read that the American ambassador has clearly and categorically explained at yesterday's Amchan meeting that he, they fully understand Bangladesh's equation with China in, in so far as BRI is concerned. And uh, of course, he didn't mention the, the, America, the America, uh, Chinese investment bank. So they have no I think that the BRI as a concept you know, you are talking about integration in Eurasia. I submit that this will not only be of benefit to Bangladesh, but the whole region. Because if you are talking of BDIM, that also encompasses this. And we have to go forward to linkages in trade. For instance, you talked about the solar, the, the Chinese uh, help that uh, India is getting in solar. So I, what I'm uh, saying that as far as Bangladesh is concerned, we have no other ambition except the one and the only wholesome ambition is to give a better life to the 160 million Bangladeshis. And in deep, that way, we can have a very, very positive contribution, not just for our people and our country, but also for the region. That is our uh, purpose and we welcome you. It was a very good talk in the month of March, month of our independence, where the independence war begins and our war heroes are seated here. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah. <coughs> Thank you, Ambassador yes. uh, yeah. <coughs> My name, <coughs> my name is Siraj Islam. I am a retired ambassador. My last post was Bangladesh's ambassador to China. We have at uh, uh, Japan. Sorry, we have listened to a very interesting lecture by Dr. Saran, and it is interesting in the sense that you know. Some of the things you have said, Dr. Saran, is, are the things that we have, we have waited and waited and waited to hear from New Delhi. We have not heard till you came and spoke, it, uh, spoke about it to us. You seem to have given us the impression that if we, with this concept of Indo Pacific, India Bangladesh, you are saying that Bangladesh has a very major role to play. And you are also suggesting that is where Indian Bangladesh should cooperate to take the two countries together and build up the link between India, Bangladesh and Indo-Pacific. That would be a big yes. in a contribution of yes. this region to the rest of the world no, to and do uh, a lot of good things. But you know, as uh, 
my uh, former boss, Mr. Rulli Singh Chaudhary, was a, a deputy foreign state, state minister for foreign affairs when I was in the foreign ministry. As he has said, you know, if that is what is correct, if that is the perspective you are, think, you are saying <coughs> in India, from the Congress to the BJP, wasn't sure if the BJP would take her on board and support <coughs> what the Congress had done. So before touching base with Mr. Modi, we were touching very base with the BTP government that she had gone to China. And then the 665 paragraph joint declaration, almost all of them were strategic, and all of them cooperation between Bangladesh and China, cooperation for better Indo Pacific development, but a lot of them were also directed against India. That is the key you know, front for a strategic perspective of China. Then, immediately, I think two months after that, Mr. Shushma Swaraj was in Dhaka. And then they told our Prime Minister what they had done. He said, not acceptable to us, not one of them. Then came Mr. Uh, Narendra Modi the next year. And by the end of 2015, that 65 you know, paragraph joint declaration was torn, torn to shreds. Torn, torn. Then everything changed. Every, now, I'm coming to the other perspective. Our Prime Minister came to power this time. One of the major statements she made, there's not been very much contact. I'm afraid to disappoint you. After our, this government came to power on 30th December for the third time, except for the one commitment message from Delhi, there's been not, not very many contacts. In my perspective, our foreign minister went, the four you know, the, the, the things that were signed, all four of them were MOUs. MOU between two governments, a sign at that level does not sign any depth of in, in a relationship. So what I'm trying to tell you is this time, Delhi was not very ha happy with what has happened in Bangladesh because this time, as many people are starting to say, there has been a strategic shift in Bangladesh over the shoulder of India towards China. And the other thing I'm talking about is that after coming to power, our Prime Minister made an open statement at once. I think if I count correctly, at least three times, she had told India, what is, why are you referring to the BII? Come and join BRI. It is to our advantage. It is to our advantage. It's to the advantage of South Asia. It's to, to the advantage of the entire region. So why are you? And she has not responded. By the way, you may like to carry to Delhi. She has not responded to a prime minister's offer to uh, to India not to be afraid of BRI because it will be good for everybody. The final thing I'd like to tell you about is the Indo-Pacific strategy. I do some writing for the papers. I'm a columnist. If I remember this concept, this originally. Asia Pacific strategy that was articulated by Mr. Obama during his visit to Australia in uh, 2011. The primary primary basis of this in Asia Pacific strategy is one pivot towards Asia because Asia, China, India were coming up so fast that the rest of the other the, the three pillars upon which Asia Pacific strategy was built, the one of the major you know strategy which was the economic foundation which was based on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The first thing he did was he took America out of it. So Americans, in my understanding, has very little interest in, in the Pacific strategy as it stands now. The other one is, is what happened in the in United Nations in December. I think it was 6th of December. United States, the European Union, India, together, they managed to get all references, UN resolution, all references on DRI out of the UN system. So, United States, India today is not only opposed to BRI, India is firmly opposed to BRI, and that is why two months have gone past and there has been no response to the Prime Minister's offer to India. That is where I come to the rosy picture, <coughs> picture you have given. If this is reported to the Foreign Ministry, this is coming from India. You know, this is the dream. This is what our government is saying. We have brought about a diplomatic coup in Bangladesh. Here we are. We will meet the Chinese cow, we will meet the Indian cow, and together we will build Bangladesh. The final thing I'd like to leave it to you is this rosy picture you are giving of India coming to Bangladesh, listening to us, and it's telling them what to do on BRI, on Asia Pacific Corporation. The problem of the small countries of South Asia is India is too big a brother for us. They have not only been telling us what to do, they have been dictating, dictating us what to do. 
this for the first time in Bangladesh, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh has for the first time taken a country out of the Indian perspective diplomatically. So the rosy picture you are giving of India Bangladesh relationship two months is almost three months now since the latest government compared to the prior government. And all of them are very friendly towards India. Thank you. So we will not go over there and again this one question and this is again for more of our audience. I would really like to say why do we abase ourselves with this a small country? 170 million population, sizable middle class. Now why would we even have the mindset that we are a small country? Small country yeah. maybe in terms of geographical size. Mm -hmm. Because whenever we are going on to a discussion with our neighbors and we say oh we are a small country we are putting ourselves in the back foot. But coming back to the question at hand. Yeah. Uh, First of all, uh, I agree with Dr. Saran when you say that we respond better when you work together. So what has stopped the central government in India from helping us or from working with us in finding an effective solution for the Rohingya problem? Yes. Question number one. And that is, will also explain one of the reasons why, again, China's outsized influence in recent times. Because we have to all look in the context. That's number one. And number two is, again, because it's a bit of a tangential question, but based on the Pulwama incident, how has it altered India's image as a net security provider for the region? Thank you very much. Thank you, Parvez. Uh, I'll come back to you, Mr. Chaudhary and Ambassador Shofila. Before that, uh, Professor Dilara Chaudhary? No? Ambassador Nassim Petos? No? OK, then Ambassador Shofila, please. To welcome you because India and Bangladesh are at my side for the sake of self determination of the people of Bangladesh. Now, we don't know what the India's position now on the question of self determination to the people who are struggling in and out for their own destiny. It comes to the question at point. What is India's position now in the self determination of the people? India has, with an Latin society, it supported the development of people, <coughs> the convention of the people around the world. Now we are not very sure what is India's latest position on this subject. Number two, if we are created for the integration of Bangladesh. You are right also, there is no time <coughs> to listen to a dictate by other countries. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, coming back to you, Mr. Yamane Choudhury, Mr. Human. Before that, Professor Mishra. No, I think I heard one question. I, I heard four people uh, make a very interesting intervention. But uh, there was only one question on Bangladesh's relationship with China. And that relationship, its nature, its texture, its depth, its expanse, has to be a decision of Bangladesh. And I agree with my friend then. As a 170 million strong country with a GDP which is just under 300 billion dollars in 2019, you should not be dictated by anyone. You should not be. And I think it's time to stop looking at yourself as a small country. I completely agree with you. I came here to tell you that you're a big country. And, and, and the questions I receive are from a small country. So that's, that is a self imagination that needs to change. I think today you are at a you are at a point in your in your evolution as a nation where you have choices galore. You can quote the Americans if you want. You can quote the Chinese if you want. You have the Indians if you seek to engage in that relationship. And these are national decisions. I don't speak for India. I work in a think tank. I'm a academic. I I will certainly take your views back with me, but they will remain with me. I don't go and brief the prime ministers like many of you might in your official or informal affairs. But uh, let me convey to you that uh, we are deeply democratic people and we respect democratic decisions. You want to embrace the BRI, go ahead and do it. Who's stopping you? If you believe an empty port is a great port to have, do it. Amman Tota is a great example. You want to build a white elephant because it is symbolically uh, soulful, go and do it. If you think that's great economics, go ahead and do it. Decision. We are, you should not allow anyone else to dictate your economic and political choice. But please understand, let me give you our version of it. We were all alone when everyone was present in the court of empress. 
when the BRI was launched. We were a single country standing outside. We are no longer alone. Many of those who were there in his court today raise the same questions we raised back then. That it is opaque, it is unaccountable, it is perverse, it creates debt trap diplomacy, it exploits resources of the countries it is present there. And if you have a different conclusion, show me the data sets. I can show you data sets to tell you this is bad economics. If you can show me data sets where BRI has created favorable economic growth, please tell me. I will educate myself. Now, you certainly have a valid argument to make if you say that any country interferes in your internal decision making process. I think that is bad. I think it is bad. I am an independent free voice. I, have, I can say what I want to and I think no country in the world should dictate any decisions taken by sovereign independent nation states. Whether it is China, whether it is India, whether it is Bangladesh. So I think the relationship that Bangladesh seems to create with China is Bangladesh's alone to make. And I think Bangladesh, you are right, you are right, can milk, someone said the word milk, uh, 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 the Indian cow, the Chinese cow, the American cow. Just please understand what is the price tag attached to that milk before you start milking the cows. There are no free milk, there are no free lunches. So I am just trying to say that when you milk the cows, no, sir, I'm, I'm, I, I will, I will, let me just complete my thought, I, I have a process here. So I think let me first support your right, your obligation to your own people and your aspirations to create your own architecture, I am with you. you I will carry this message back to the academic community, my reach does not go beyond that. I don't speak for the central government, nor for the state government. Not for Narendra Modi, not for Mamta Belich. They will talk to you about Pista, and I hope both of them will work together to resolve the things that is. Okay? India is not a single country. India is a union of individual or uh, 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 regions. And we have to carry multiple interests. Each region of ours also says the same. Why should Delhi decide our future? What, you know, the, the West Bengal state says New Delhi cannot decide my approach to uh, certain issues. Maharashtra says the same, Andhra Pradesh says the same, Tamil Nadu says the same. So we have to also create national consensus and we have to do it in a democratic way. Unfortunately, India does not have uh, the Communist Party of India that can do that. We have a very de democratic polity and we do it through sometimes painfully long processes. And I apologize. That is the cost of democracy. That sometimes consensus building takes longer than authoritarian systems uh, are able to do. And, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's a democratic outcome. It's inefficient period. But please be convinced there is no malevolence. There is no great Chanakya game at play. Sun Tzu was anyway far more popular than Chanakya. So you should be worried about Sun Tzu. <laughs> you know, if you want to talk about uh, geo strategy, then you know, art of war is what you should be worried about. Because they were the only ones who went with their boats around the world and had a tributary system. I have not heard of Chanakya Niti in any part else of the world other than in India. If you were to tell me a historic example where Chanakya Niti was applied in international destinations, again educate me. But the art of war was. So again we must have a context right. That here you have certainly a big neighbor and that big neighbor will cast a shadow and we must change ourselves and we must become far more responsive to concerns of our uh, uh, region and our and our partners, and I'm certain, and I can I can uh, I can uh, tell you that I have said this so many times in our internal debates that we do not set the relationship tenor right. India has not got it right. We do not engage in the manner that we need to. We need to be far more responsive, reflective, sensitive to uh, a region. I have no doubt in saying you know I have, I have no trouble in stating this unequivocally. India will have to get its house in order and re-engage in a new format in the 21st century in its way. India has a lot of catching up to do. But you are not a small country. And I think that is my message to you. That you are a big country who has created big transformation. You are outperforming many of your neighbors. Someone mentioned this, right? In the in, in development parameters. So, so, so on the China front, Please go ahead, milk the Chinese cow. And if you get it cheap, please give us some milk as well. <laughs> Our response to BRI is a sovereign response. 
And the same way we will not interfere in your sovereignty, you should not impede on ours. If an occupied territory of India is used to construct an infrastructure that belongs to a third country, it is akin to someone taking your land and building his own territorial interest over it. We have rejected the BRI. But that does not mean that we are not the second largest investor in the Asian Infrastructure Bank. The projects where we see that there is no territorial uh, issue, where uh, equity of international law is adhered to, we are participants with the Chinese. We co-created the BRICS Bank. We are the second largest investments in the New Development Bank. We are certainly going to engage with them on commerce, on the startup sector, in the gig economy, in technology, in, in heavy industries, in, in infrastructure. We are going to engage with them. But where we believe our freedom and our territorial integrity is, is, is being uh, overlooked for commercial benefit, we will push back. The same way that you push back against some propositions today which I did not make by you. None of the response to me was something that I had suggested. I had not suggested ever that you should not engage with China. I, in fact, I said that Bangladesh is in that unique moment of its evolution that it has many options. You don't have the constraints that India has. You can engage with the Chinese. If you want to build Humble Tota Part 2, please build it. You know, that's a choice that Sri Lanka has to make for itself. Uh, that's a choice Bangladesh will make for itself. That's a choice. Uh, uh, Maldives and others have also made. So it is sovereign choices. You don't have to worry about India's position on BRI to make your own decision on BRI. Please join the BRI. But you don't have to force me to change my decision on BRI. My decision on BRI is based on my sovereign uh, concerns. And there's a basis for it. And we have explained it. And we have also said that we are willing to participate in institutions where this concern does not uh, uh, impede with that uh, integration. And I gave you two examples, New Development Bank, we have co-created with the Chinese, Asian Infrastructure Bank, which you are going to benefit, where India is the second largest equity industry. So I think in the 21st century is a century of two kinds of coalitions. Coalitions of purpose, whenever you have common purpose, you should make partnerships and coalitions. Second, coalitions of convenience. We, the ideological and the ethical moorings of the past century are gone. We are not going to have a capitalist formation of the Western bloc and the communist formation of the Eastern bloc anymore. We are going to have moving coalitions, temporary coalitions, coalitions of purpose and objectives, coalitions of convenience. We are, the, we are living in the 21st century. The old formats of aggregation in the past have to be rethought. And Bangladesh has the unique advantage of being member of many coalitions. All I am saying is your size, your location, today, is going to allow you to be part of many such arrangements that will implicate the larger global system. Please play your game well. It is for you to seize this moment. We are happy to partner with you because we will benefit from your help. You will give us certain solutions, we will give you certain solutions. Experience sharing is going to be beneficial for both of us. So are markets, so are integration, so is infrastructure. And you are absolutely right. We can reject the BRI. Let me give you uh, another pragmatic answer to the BRI question because I heard this many times across all interventions this morning. Do you think that if India has rejected BRI, if a port is built under BRI, let's say the Suez Canal 2, or the Suez Canal 2 is a part of the BRI, do you think Indian ships will not move through that? There is a pragmatic. Let me tell you because you are going too fast. You are too fast. Yeah, yeah. You see, the problem is you are from the academic world, you are think tank. You don't know, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, you don't know the dynamics how two countries operate. There is a formal level where a foreign minister goes to your country, your foreign minister comes to country, there's a formal level of relationship. You know the form? Why does India have a barbed wire around Bangladesh? Sorry? Why does India have a barbed wire around Bangladesh? It shouldn't have. Yes? It shouldn't have. In fact, if you read my article this morning, I have said we should have soft borders. I'm afraid to tell you. Yeah, you shouldn't have. You have come totally. No, oh, I know it is. It has. Totally ignorant about how the intelligence of your country works Sir. in the way. Uh, listen, I, I, listen. I, let, let me show Because the way you are talking, it is to me. Because I'm a petition. I've, got, I've been DG for South Asia. I've been you know, in the foreign ministry for 30 years. And you have dealt with India. The certain things I can talk about here. But all I can tell you, it is not the forum to talk about. It. But don't mind. You are a totally ignorant person. Academically, you're right. You have written brilliant papers. But the dynamics of the relationship, how the intelligence, you know what? Before the federal December election, 
course, we have to do much more in managing and sharing of resources. Which are water is one, right? And again, like I said, sometimes it's a painful process, and sometimes we'll have to bring more people uh, on board to reach that consensus. Because we are a complicated country, you are a divided country. We are multiple <coughs> divided countries. We have multiple uh, uh, personas. The, the rate of New Delhi is not that is not that powerful. You know that people assume the central government is is not necessarily uh, uh, deciding on issues where the state governments have uh, the constitutional ability to intervene. It's plural. No, no, multiple. It has multiple power uh, dynamics. So uh, the the West Bengal uh, issue that you raised, is certainly a problem. And uh, I was not suggesting that it is a again. I, it was an aspiration and not a reflection of reality. Mm -hmm. We have to move towards a soft border. I have written about it this morning that uh, uh, digit borders do not reflect good relationships. Borders have to be porous and soft. And if we really want to be an integrated digit, we will have to rethink the rigidities that we have created. And I think this is uh, clearly a reflection of 1947, which is unfortunately playing out even in the east of India. We have to have a complete rethink and that rigidity has to disappear, soft open porous borders has to be the way if we have to integrate it. The third point that you raised was on uh, uh, the, the, the third point that I suggested was on uh, you know you had mentioned about interference. I'm an academic and I don't understand power dynamic, but if you ask me the academic, I think countries should not interfere. I think countries must respect political processes. So again, again, I think I, I think we can we can become at home in them and attack. But I'm not. I, 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 no, so I I, I I I do not want to get personal and at home in But 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 believe you me that as both of us evolve our own political systems, so you will find that we will all this uh, in our engagement with each other. Again, it is not something. We is not a reality. We is an aspiration. So the word we that I use is in hope, not a reflection of uh, the state of affairs. Now, having said that, I think there are possibilities, and I'm only hoping that those possibilities can be uh, Mr. Inam Hamid Chaudhary, former secretary. There are a few member of parliaments. Well, uh, Dr. Sir, uh, when you spoke about, uh, you were just speaking about the uh, the uh, solution of the Tista River, Tista River, and you talked about the interest of different states that you have. When you talk to India, we talk to India, the government of India. And when the government of India talks to us, we presume that the government of India has taken care of the interests of the constituents. You see, we cannot individually go. Individually go and talk to government of West Bengal. We cannot have a treaty with government of West Bengal, nor can we have a, a treaty with government of Assam or Mizoram or any, any other state of India. So when we talk to India and we request that the Indian government talks to us, they would take the responsibility of the constituents and then talk to us. In that case, only we know what is uh, India capable of doing. We, if we're not capable of solving the Tista issue or sharing of the rivers, then you have to say that we are not capable of solving yeah. this another issue. So this is very, very important that this point is you see, has been raised by a number of uh, our speakers here. You, the, the question of water sharing is of utmost importance. And I would like you to take back to India and let the government know, and the people who better know, that this matters so much to us. And on this depends Indo Bangladesh relation to a very, very big extent. I mean the big, big relationship. Secondly, when you talk about India, Bangladesh, and Indo Pacific, I was thinking what way when we started off with the Sala, your interesting discourse. And why did you call it Sark and Indo Pacific? Then, of course, you try to uh, say, the, uh, suggest the irrelevance of the South Asian structure. You know. But as a matter of fact, as we presume, you see, if we take our you see, contiguity and togetherness, such up from our being in South Asia together. So this is an important thing we have to bear in mind. And I think the South Asian context gives us a greater sense of reliance. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. 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 
Thank you, uh, Ms. Moderator. Since I'm the chairman of BIISS, I would like to use this opportunity to once again uh, welcome uh, about geopolitics and then also about uh, Rabindranath Tagore and saying that Rabindranath Tagore did not understand or did not talk about geopolitics, but I think we remember a very important poem by him, Bharat Tirtho, which is in many ways his understanding of geopolitics and how India is very important and India can help this region to become one. So that is a dream that uh, we hope that it can come, uh, happen sometime that you talk about the cultural integration. Cultural integration, when you talk about that, such becomes very important. When uh, we say South Asia, that gives India becomes the dominant country in this region, whether we like, whether some people like it or not. And would you agree, uh, Dr. Saran, that in India's ambition to become a world leader, I think it has that ambition and it is a good thing. Uh, SAR would have provided India the best platform to lead. If it can successfully lead SAR, this region, then it proves its uh, uh, itself as a true leader in the world. But anyways, let's get back to your uh, discourse. I think it was very interesting. The three uh, conflicts or uh, collapse, uh, collapses you mentioned about. The third one, you did not say who the main actor was while for the first two you mentioned. So, is Huawei some kind of a, 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 a a symptom in this regard. I'd like to ask, uh, tell us about that. Uh, then another two things that I'd like to take from your uh, lecture. You mentioned about Bangladesh, India, going into all kinds of innovations and technology uh, or um, uh, creation of technology that others can subscribe. But here I think I will just slightly diff um, change this, that both Bangladesh and India and other countries also, they should be focusing on resolving their own problems, using new technology, innovating new technology, uh, looking at their own challenges, they will find out solutions to them. Others will find High Commissioner in Dhaka, quite some time ago. And uh, we were talking about all kinds of things and I, uh, I asked him one question as to that when the USA signed this uh, uh, civilian nuclear deal with India, many US leaders openly said that USA was trying to use India to contain China in open discussions. Then the Indian leaders came out with saying that no, we do not serve anybody else's interest, we serve our own interest, we have our own autonomous relations with, China and other countries. And then I told my friend that India must help us to have our own autonomous relations with China and other countries. That was one. And the other story is, I was in Pune some time ago when there was this uh, Symbiosis University was organizing their annual conference and this time the theme was Act East Policy of India. Lucas Act East Policy of India. And there was a very important, I won't name him, very important Indian uh, leader, a decision maker. Uh, he was speaking, and he was speaking about all things. And also, the BRI came in to his uh, featured in his speech. And then he start, He became very angry about the CPEC, which we are mentioning right now, that it comes through uh, uh, the uh, disputed territory. And so he was very unhappy. And he said that we have been telling China not to do it, but if they do not listen to us, we will join it. He said it in anger, but I think that is the answer. Well, you have differences of opinion, but I think being together is better than fighting each other. And uh, BRI, uh, when we join BRI, we should all remember that we have to decide the terms and conditions of how we join. It's, if we join on the wrong terms and conditions, we'll end up in a dead trap. But if we do the due diligence, all of us will benefit. Thank you. 
I think, oh, one more question at this place. Uh, is he had a generous voice, left and generous voice. Yes, uh, I've been serving in the army for 40 years. I've visited China a number of times. And what is unique? Why China is, you have mentioned in two angles, China is leading. Okay? Because whatever the Chinese political leadership, military leadership, what our national poet, Kabinudul Islam, if you have been talking about Rabindu Ranta, I am talking about Kabinudul Islam, what he has wrote, Kararoi Loho Kapat. So, at that time, we never thought about our independence. We were still voting for to become the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Isn't it? But he told some time, and then we became the independent. I tried to interpret that poem in French language, and once I was in Ivory Coast as UN mission, I showed it to my liaison officer. Can I give it to the school headmasters? After reading this, sir, please don't do it. There will be revolution in the Ivory Coast. They will fight the French up. I said, okay, I will not do this international crime. But he was very happy to read that, that you have such a poem, a poet in, in your country. But there was another presentation in this room where I, I have been shown and, and, uh, by, by Jahanganagar University uh, let, and professor, eminent professor, and map upside down. And then he wrote the caption, Chindia, Chin, India, Bangladesh, and capital is Dhaka. He has shown his vision that it can be. The question is this, are we preparing ourselves or we are sending our children, educated brilliant graduates to serve other countries of the world? We are doing that because we have not given our environment here. So if you want to have an influence on such issues, we have to create this nation. Now we have given our example of by whose, whose power we are putting their ballot box. Well, what we have done, still we are seeing our television and we have not protested, we have not gone to the street. Somebody will come and give you the democracy in your hand. If we expect, next time, next time, it will come on next time and next time. The question is this, an educated society is very, very important. Mm. Our education system has gone to now only GPA 5. As if GPA 4 is failed. As if now GPA 4 is, means is failed. GP 1, 2, 3, no question at all. So we have destroyed our own education system. So once he is showing a big dream, our education at the intellectual level is going other way around. This is another way of keeping a nation down under your feet. So as sir you have mentioned, why we feel small? Because around what we see, that you feel like, I'm so shy of, I'm so shy of talking in that field. Sir, the diplomats, you are here. Um, sir, uh, I have been attending one or two such a conference. I found the other side, but the Indian side, not you, Indian government side, came with such a preparation, then what are the uh, agreement we signed with India and Bangladesh on the Ganges and the Tista, and our diplomats didn't have the knowledge what happened two years back. And once they have given the reference, so our diplomat says, can you give me a photocopy? So in the discussions module, in the table, they were asking for a photocopy from your counterpart, you have exposed yourself. So this is our fault. Now, what vision he has given, he has he also mentioned that it is not 20 years or three generations or four generations. But don't you think we should go and have a dream that Bangladesh as a nation will have a big footprint, not only exporting labor, but we ourselves will rise as a Bangladeshi and people will recognize us. For that, we need education and real democracy in this Bangladesh. That everything will happen for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Thank you, sir. Let me uh, very quickly, uh, maybe I was not clear in my presentation. I am not uh, dismissing South Asia or South. I am saying they are no longer the most important region for the Indo-Pacific because the Indo-Pacific is now such a larger construct that we will have to create a much larger group of countries who are similarly placed to negotiate our position in that system. So I was saying if Bangladesh and India and others can actually create a foundational linkage between Southeast Asia and South Asia, both of them together, 
might be a geography that has enough market size and clout to see favorable economic and political outcomes in the international system. It does not mean that as individual countries you don't negotiate your own agenda. It only means that when you are finding space in the multilateral and regional uh, 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 arrangements, it is better to go as a collective than to go alone. Uh, the same, uh, the TPP was a great example, America backed out, but smaller countries could negotiate collectively with the Americans. Uh, if they had done a bilateral with the Americans, the Americans would have eaten them for breakfast. Right? So they decided that as 13 countries, let's come to certain terms and eventually Donald Trump walked out because some of the terms of the trade that they had uh, negotiated under the TPP were not favorable to the Americans. And why were they not favorable? Because the smaller countries could collectively seek a better uh, uh, terms of trade. So all I'm saying is that it's not, I'm not asking you to not have an autonomous foreign policy. I'm saying in the international system, when you are uh, negotiating on trade, finance, climate deals, etc., sometimes a collective bargaining power is more than that of an individual. And that is where I'm saying that because our development aspirations are the same, India and, India and Bangladesh have a lot of work to do at home. Uh, uh, India is not a, uh, 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 India has already, okay, I, I'm an academic, like Sir has mentioned. Let me use the privilege of being an academic and say, till 2030, India is an internal job. For the next 12 years, India's challenge is to resolve its own house. We have to live, lift 100 million people out of poverty. We have to provide healthcare to all. We have to provide education and skills to all. These ambitions and aspirations are science fiction. Next 10 years, we have to work at home. We are an internal job. And we want partners who will help us in our internal <coughs> agenda. Bangladesh is a viable partner for that. Uh, the region is important for that. A favorable international environment, which means in terms of trade, finance, etc., are important for that. We are not going to be a security provider in the American sense. All we will be able to do is that make sure we are the first responders when an earthquake hits somewhere, or all 50,000 people have to be evacuated from Libya, or 100,000 have to be evacuated from other West Asian country. 30, 40, 50, 60 countries will use our uh, infrastructure and our fleets and our ships and our planes to evacuate their citizens. We are a we are a first responder. We are not the NATO style, American style security provider. It's not going to happen. The world has changed with the change of the century. The order will be very different going forward. All of us will have to create our own security, hard security arrangements, and we'll have to create a secure collective security umbrella that responds to human needs. You know what happens in Nepal, what happens in India regularly, what happens in South Asia. We are all going to increasingly come under that stress, national disasters. Um, uh, incidents and accidents are going to stress our capabilities and we'll have to work together on that. And that is what we can do. It is not the Rambo style intervention that uh, 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 of the 20th century that you go to see. That's, that's gone with the Hollywood movies. Uh, on, on the point of, and it's, I wanted to come back to your question, that's why I came back to that. Um, on the third dimension, I think that's a very important question. The only reason I said the Chinese are needing in the Eurasian continent, the Chinese are needing in the Indo Pacific arrangement. On the on the third one, I think if you were to if I was a betting man, I would say the Chinese would win in the third dimension as well. I think even in the technology and future technology sectors, I think the Chinese have shown remarkably have shown remarkable capacity to create new innovation. I am not counting the Americans out there. I'm not counting them out. Because I still think that in this dimension the private sector and the capitalist system is far more agile and nimble than a state-controlled system is. So I still think that in, when it comes to future tech and, and cutting-edge technology, the Americans may still have the edge. I don't give, I, but I don't consider them as a clear leader, so I did not mention their name. I think it, it is a contested space, and our choices, and again I'm telling in you In terms here, of talents, they have better access. Correct. So you know, the one American diplomat told me, the Chinese have only 1.3 billion people. We have all the people of the planet. We can get, get anyone into our university system, into our research lab. We can, we can, because of our policies, we can source the best talent into our own universities. So, you know, th that's one of the strengths. So I'm not uh, yet counting the Americans out. I think they have a clear uh, advantage in that particular sector. But the Chinese are important actors. And again, here I'm saying this. The choices India and Bangladesh make in terms of our own technology uh, ecosystem, you know, in India, we jokingly say that there are three uh, technologies in India. China Tech, US Tech, and India Tech. The other two are doing much better. China Tech and, and, and the US Tech. Uh, India Tech is growing, but it is not at the same 
uh, parity as the other country. In Bangladesh too, you will have to make that choice. That are you going to adopt and embrace a Chinese model of technology and technological systems? Uh, attitude towards privacy, towards surveillance, towards data control, etc. Or are you going to go for a more liberal ecosystem uh, in that? That's again a choice we make. And the choices we make as smaller uh, powers is going to eventually change the global ecosystem. So again, it's an important decision we need to make. So can Tech become a normative body which proposes 10 ethics and yet they embrace the Americans on all matters of economics. America underwrote the rise of China. Many of us have to make sure that we can somehow tap into the Chinese surpluses for our own growth and development purposes. And that is pragmatic foreign policy. And that is real quality. No one is saying that because you are doing this you are becoming a slave of anyone. I think we have to serve our self-interest. Surpluses exist in a region. We have to find the right transmission vehicles to get the funds to us, to get the technology to us, to get the markets. I think everyone realizes. Like I said, we are a world which is far more pragmatic than the one in the last century. The ideological considerations should be dismissed. More pragmatic and real politic decisions should define our policy. Uh, sir, I'll take the message back to uh, Delhi on water. Uh, I don't know who hears my voice in Delhi, but I will shout loudly. Uh, I will also write about it and I will convey your sentiments. And I get a sense of it. And it's not that we are inure and immune, but we are a crazy country, loud country, and there are so many things happening. Sometimes these important issues uh, get subsumed and get overwhelmed by some of the more mundane stuff that democracies produce. And this issue has to be persistent. I agree. And, 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 and uh, I also concede the point that as a nation state, it is not a valid excuse to say that I have internal divisions. When you deal as a nation state, the nation state must ensure compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the last round. And we are almost at the end of the program. We have to finish in few minutes. So I am requesting you to make a comment as short as you can. Okay. Barisha uh, Shamim Hadar Patwari, Member of Parliament. Barisha Shamim. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Mr. Jilul, and uh, Dr. Shamin has uh, given a very insight uh, and very um, thought-provoking speech, uh, which opens some new dimensions. Uh, I've listened also to the qualities and comments. Uh, most of us have seen very much anxious to have a better relation with China, uh, but we cannot forget 1971 when India was our best friend, who saved us from genocide. So, so they, they helped us to get independence. I like to pose one question to everyone. I am also envious to have a good relation with China. I visited China last, last month. Can we afford an um, uh, effort a Chinese friend at the cost of Indian enmity? Of course not. Or Indian animals? Of course not. The ground reality in this country, you all know. We have to make it customized. That is so important. And now I like to pose some question to the honorable speaker. Um, first, we talk about internationalism or multilateralism in the Pacific, but when the question of BRI come, you firmly come into your sovereign issue. This is my country, I will not go. If you want to go, if you want to go. This is, I think, paradise within inside. Because if you want to lead something, you cannot say this is my choice, I will go. If you don't want, you cannot go. Second, SARC is a complete failure, to my view. And people in this region believe this is because of Indian non cooperation. When SARC is a failure because of Indian non-cooperation, what other uh, cooperation that you are offering will be successful in your view? And why will people in this region will have faith on India that India will make it success? Finally, uh, we think, we believe that the Rohingya issue came up. Also the religious pluralism, that is also an issue in India. And whenever the Rohingya issue is moving in Myanmar border, also in Asham and Orisha, there is a double D or triple D, detect and deport issue at the same time. So how can you become a uh, regional leader or big brother when these sensitive issues you're raising within the country? So, so it's such a big country with such a small problem, big nation with a small problem uh, or small issues uh, posing their nose. So you want your, I know you're not a politician. It's not been, the pillars have not been put in, are all on land that divides the 
rivers, the six rivers on which India has agreed on you know, demarcating, because the river has moved, etc., etc. So that is one issue that we must concentrate on if we want Bangladesh to be Thank you, Mr. Nair. I see many hands, but I don't know how can I, man how can I will manage this, because we are running out of time. We have many engagements today. Uh, my journalist friend, sitting in the back. Relationship and independent foreign policy. Uh, I think there is a difference between independence and autonomous. People of Tibet can understand it very well. Number one. Number two uh, is that I fully agree with the notion uh, of Dr. Saron that why do we need to be dictated by somebody else? Why? It is our problem. It's not anybody's problem. If anybody dictates us, that's his perhaps credit. Because it's human instinct to dictate others. So, if we are dictated, I don't know, because, you know, geopolitical things sound very vague to me. And to me, these are some flowery uh, phrases. Actually, I mean, these things don't matter to me. What matters to me is that our people are not being killed along the border. What means to me is that this uh, uh, is solved. What matters to me is that there is a huge trade deficit that needs to be addressed. And with the greatest of respect to Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Soron, uh, he said that he apologized uh, uh, for being democracy. Uh, for being democratic. You said that, haven't you? No. I, uh, I said democracy is inefficient. All right, okay. So I also apologize for being democratic uh, due to what has happened day before yesterday in the university where I studied. Anyway, so democracy has its, uh, uh, has its thing. But, 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 but Mr. Saro, one thing I want to remind you, Mr. Saro, one thing I want to remind you with the greatest of respect, that Tista is not an Indian internal issue anymore because Tista was supposed to be signed on September 6, 2011 at the, our Prime Minister's office. And the initial of the, and the draft of the agreement was initialed by two water resources secretaries. So it was supposed to be signed and Mamuta Banerjee suddenly uh, uh, turned turn her back on Bangladesh. And now, are you asking me to believe that a sophisticated diplomatic wing like South Bloc did not know that Mahmoudah Banerjee is not on board and they have uh, uh, ready the uh, agreement to be signed? Well, uh, I will be the last person to believe that. Now, I will finish with another thing. Uh, you Mr. Mark, please, sir. Uh, I'll finish right away. Uh, regarding you say the P2P thing, believe me, I'm a very frequent visitor to India. I have been visiting India since 1985. My daughter studies in India uh, at the university in Punjab. So I go there, I mean, every month almost. <coughs> Problem with the P2P thing is, one, people of India do not know Bangladesh. I have been in Assam before our election. Not, two, not more than two to three percent people know that there was an election in Bangladesh. People of Mizoram, which borders Bangladesh, they even don't know Bangladesh. And forget about South India and other things. So it is our fault. It is a uh, fault on our part. And I don't know what you, uh, you have anything please, to do. Please. And one last thing is that People of Bangladesh's favorable view towards India is always overstated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Um, I am a lawyer by profession and probably least experienced in this room because I'm quite young in my profession. Um, because the discussion is on India and Bangladesh, I would like to say that I think both of the countries are doing amazingly in our respect cases. Uh, one question that I have, and I've been thinking about it for a while, but I didn't have anybody as probably in the same wavelength as you are, 
I just wanted to say, what are your thoughts about the most talked about citizenship amendment bill in India that has happened recently? And uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, probably not even ask, but just know your thoughts on that and say that what has got religion uh, to do with any, anyone's citizenship? Thank you very much. Uh, that is also your question, Tasnia. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, again and again. Uh, to fail to understand the people's pulse of Bangladesh and people's perception of Bangladesh. So, so in, is India ready to get outcome uh, which already India got from Maldives, Sri Lanka, yes. and Bhutan, and Maldives? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, last one, Dr. Monju. Okay. Just question. Thank you, Jill. I thought that uh, I will not get some uh, scope to say a few words. Uh, my uh, observation, uh, I'm a uh, student of South Asia as well. Uh, so, with the many speakers said, the perception of Indian foreign policy, the perception, they should make friendship with the people of Bangladesh, not with a particular party or a particular person. As our teacher said, that India picked a few people and made them students. Not like that. They must people to people friendship. Let me uh, cite an example. One of my friends helped it to the South Block. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Mandira Mathilde, this person. Okay. And hope we, most of we meet in the evening. Okay. Uh, uh, thank Dr. Shoran for uh, approaching a new ideas uh, about uh, this reason. First thing. I will not ask you a question about Indo-Bangladesh relationship because there are too many questions. I will get into that Indo-Pacific thing. You painted a picture where Bangladesh will play a big role, Bangladesh will be a powerful country. My very simple question is that, without military power, is, is there any example where a nation became powerful, became uh, influential, and you see that uh, India, China, Pakistan, North Korea, in this Indo-Pacific uh, uh, Indo area, they have become <coughs> nuclear power. And without military power, is Bangladesh going to play a, uh, a crucial role in this? Uh, so do you think that we have to also consider that aspect that uh, to become a nuclear nation in future? Thank you, Dr. Choudhury. Dr. Samir sir, final words. Let me just get through from here because there are a number of questions that quickly go through them. I think it's uh, pretty much. No, let me, let me tell you, I really enjoyed myself today. I think I'm, it, it was like any good Indian conference where uh, uh, we make a few. Well, let me start with my friend from the Tribune. I think uh, we overstate, like we overestimate uh, Bangladesh's affinity to India. You know, you mentioned that point. I think you overestimate India's sophisticated foreign policy. I think it is highly overrated. Uh, I think we are we have to do a lot of work to be a sophisticated international actor. Sometimes you give too much credit to South Block. And South Block is also wondering who are you talking about when you say sophisticated foreign policy. It's certainly not produced in South Block. And I think uh, I am on, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm on record that with a thousand diplomats, which is the size of the New Zealand or Singapore Foreign Service, uh, a country the size of India cannot operate. We just don't have enough space, enough attention, enough time to focus on the real questions. All our diplomats are busy being bureaucrats and not diplomats. And I think one of our biggest challenges going in the next 10 years for India would be to build its diplomatic cadre that engages not only more sufficiently with the state, but also with the people as the last uh, intervention. You know, we have to engage. Diplomacy is now going to be people-led. The new formats of diplomacy is no longer going to be G to G. It is about reaching out to communities, and that's that's the point I was making. It's not the current state of affairs. It is an aspirational place where we all have to move to. That diplomacy is between people, governments, and people, and communities and corporations begin to create their own networks and uh, 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 outcomes that help that transcend borders. You mentioned again, you know. I think independent foreign policy is the right word. Independent foreign policy is the right term. Let's be very clear. Independent debate is politically incorrect. 
So you mentioned Tibet as well, but I'm saying autonomous Tibet and independent foreign policy is, is, is the proposition on the table. And again, I'm saying it's not about China versus India. I, this keeps coming back. DRI is not a multilateral system. Who has made it into a multilateral arrangement? I have never, I have not heard that it, is, it has been signed as an international treaty. It is not a multilateral system. It is a club. You can opt into the club or opt out of the club. BRICS is not a multilateral system. It's a plurilateral arrangement that five countries decided to create. So I think to equate BRI as uh, as, as a multilateral arrangement that people, or everyone must adhere to is, is wrong. <coughs> that individual choices countries need to make whether they want to opt into that system. And I've already said that there are many elements of China's infrastructure projects in which we participate, <coughs> including their banks, including their uh, other connectivity projects and infrastructure projects. And there are many others that we don't participate in, but actually we are funding through the AIIB where we are a major shareholder. On this failure of SARC, I, I agree with uh, your intervention. I think it is an hypertension. Uh, I don't think it is a India-led failure, but it is a failure which India should have, it is a system that India should have invested more in. I think the failure is clearly because of the unfinished political agenda between two actors, and it will continue to host, uh, hold hostage the prospect of SARC. I think, uh, a, a rational arrangement, agreement and solution in South Asia is important for SARC to become a viable entity. And till such time that that happens, SARC will always underperform. I think that's a precondition. Uh, India-Pakistan settlement of a durable nature is a precondition for SARC being successful. And till such time, we will have to find other formats of engagement. Let me give you the example of the SCO, where both India and Pakistan are members. So it's not that we cannot work together in international groups. We have worked together in other forums. But SARC makes it up close and personal and raises the heckles and progress becomes more difficult. But a larger grouping where both of us are members sometimes might succeed where smaller groupings fail. So we will have to be innovative in moving beyond our legacy and our histories and embracing the future. There was a question on uh, Rohingyas. I think this was a, a highly debated issue in New Delhi and there were two different sets of opinions. One set of opinion was that we must align our uh, voice alongside Europe and the US and, and uh, some of the institutions and uh, convey this to the government. The other was that we must allow uh, and support and ensure that pressures do not force Bangladesh into anything that they don't want to. So one was that we have to be a supportive uh, neighbor. Other was we should join hands with certain other uh, narratives that are emanating from the West. And the third was uh, that we should be an um, observer. I think India probably got it right in the end. And that's my opinion, where uh, we can argue on, uh, on, on the fine points. But I think uh, it did not necessarily take a sharp edge. And it allowed spaces for organic processes to unfold. And we would expect similar positions from our neighbors when we are responding to our own questions. That yes, you may have a line, but if that line allows us an ability to find our own response, it is fair enough. And that's a fair thing to expect from neighbors. You don't have to agree on everything. But disagreements can also be polite. And I think that's something that we also have to learn, that as we work together and as we integrate, disagreements will be more frequent. And we will have to make disagreements and, and uh, certain contrary positions a part of our arrangement. But so what if we disagree on 5 out of 25 things that we work together on? There are 20 areas of agreements. And there are rules for disagreement that we follow that we will not hurt each other's interests, even though we disagree with each other. And I think we'll have to reach an arrangement that allows for that. Uh, Tista has been emphasized many times, I hear you. And I think uh, uh, clearly, and I will be honest with you, that uh, the, the, it evokes so much passion. is something that is a revelation for me. 
my first visit here, uh, and I'm I, and I think uh, we have someone from the Indian High Commission here as well. I am sure this is something that must be conveyed. That uh, I will certainly do my bit, but uh, I hear you, uh, as a as someone who is determined to uh, write and study and research our relationship. This has to be something that should be at the top end of the list when we look at issues that are holding us back or issues whose resolution can catalyze further enhancement of our relationship. I responded to the PTP. I also responded to the Pulse of Bangladesh. I think uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, we completely do not sense the Pulse of Bangladesh. I did not certainly sense the Pulse of Bangladesh. But guess what? Our government doesn't even sense the pulse of our own people. That's why they lose elections. So, so, so we, in that sense, we are consistent. We don't sense pulse of people generally. So don't take it to heart if we don't sense your pulse. We don't even sense our own pulses. Um, uh, and and you can see. And and I say this with a degree of seriousness. If you look at our democratic history, you will find we are one of those few countries who changes governments most often. There are very few prime ministers who have been returned back into office. We change our governments. It's true. And many of the time the change of government happens because the government in power has not sensed the pulse of the people. So, you know, that is something that is, uh, I think, a South Asian virtue. We don't sense the pulse of our own people quite well. And it is something that exists across the region. So, uh, uh, finally, I think, uh, I just wanted to leave uh, you with two thoughts right? because after hearing, you know, there should. Uh, I was not painting a description of today. I was looking at a road ahead over the next decade and beyond, and clearly, uh, I think we have lots to do to get to that space. You have identified some of the issues in your responses to me, and I think they are important. But we must not lose sight of the fact that there are bigger gains for both of us in the days ahead. We are still many a times distracted and overwhelmed by our histories than to have a clear sight of our future. And my submission to all of you today is that our future holds a whole cachet of opportunities that are waiting to be tapped. It is not a political statement. I have no axe to grind either in Bangladesh or in Delhi. But I do sense that we have underperformed as a region. We have underperformed as neighbors. We are the least integrated of all regions of the world. And we have rigid boundaries despite being collaborators, friends, and partners from the very inception of Bangladesh. If barbed wires and hard borders are going to define our relationship, we have failed as neighbors. I think India and Bangladesh, and this is uh, as much a plea to India as to all of you, that we have to move towards a new concept of, of soft borders and can we provide the template for whole of South Asia eventually? Can we begin that concept of having a soft border uh, and, a, and, a, uh, and a, a porous um, economic, in, uh, economic um, architecture that allows us to benefit from each other? I also hear you about trade and uh, balance of trade and uh, the economic distortions and I am uh, quite certain that if we uh, complain about China's perverse dependent relationships with us, we have to make sure that we should not follow that path. We will have to change our economic policies where uh, countries are able to benefit from our economic expansion. And it is not, our growth should not prey and should not become predatory on the growth of the region. And I think that's the second message, that I am one of those who has always been advocating at home that our economic growth must allow expansion of other economies and should not prey on their resources or on their markets. And finally, uh, with Zilur and uh, with uh, Professor Atur Rahman, uh, we want to institutionalize this conversation. I also had a feeling that perhaps not enough such conversations take place where we are able to have uh, informal, <coughs> free, frank, emotional, emotive, sometimes uh, loud uh, exchanges. I think we need to create more such conversations between uh, Indian voices, Bangladeshi voices. Uh, we are going to be working with Zilu to set up uh, an arrangement where we will bring many of you to Delhi to say exactly this to audiences in New Delhi. They should hear this firsthand. Uh, and we are going to come, keep coming back to hear from you 
and with the Center for Governance Studies, Elur and Professor Atwar Rahman, we hope to institutionalize these conversations. Uh, maybe not in this format alone, it could be more relaxed, more casual, on a round table format, but we want to do this at least four to five times each year. Uh, that's all my small institution can afford, but I think that will be a contribution to a more regular uh, 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 you know, exchange of uh, ideas, information, grievances, and solutions. So thank you very much for joining me this week. With the permission of Chair, thank you, Samir. Thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you all. And uh, please join us for refreshment. And hope to see you in the evening again. Thank you very much. <laughs>